So I will just give no, some name of algorithm, and uh, then we'll go to more protocol stuff. So in the symmetric families, basically we have two algorithms we use in the paper. AAS, maybe you know it as Reindahl. So AAS is an East standard. Actually, it's a Belgian algorithm. It was done by Vincent Reimann and Johan Damen from the KUL in Belgium. And they, they just won a contest from NIST, and it's now a standard algorithm. Until now, there are no, no known attack on AAS. The good stuff with AAS is there are a lot of people that are trying to broke AAS, and until now, they did not achieve to do it. So you can still trust it, at least right now. You have Camellia. It's a little bit less studied. You have less uh, research on trying to break Camellia, but there are a few. And until now, again, no, new, no, no known attack on Camellia. So again, you can probably trust it and use it at, uh, as a other algorithm if you want not to use AAS because you didn't trust NIST or didn't trust AAS. So just because at some point you discover that AAS is broken, then you have Camellia at least. On asymmetric side, you have RSC. Probably you know it already, and PGP, GPG. PGP, GPG is basically the, the same stuff. One is GNU and the other one is the commercial one. Uh, it's PGP, GPG is really nice. It's really used typically by SIRT, for instance, to exchange mail that are ciphered. I uh, will give some demo of using GPG afterward. But you can just integrate it to your mail client and it's, you didn't really notice that it's ciphered, but it is ciphered and it's correctly ciphered. On ashes, we have the SHA family. Recommend to use at least SHA 256, but you have all the family, there are more also now. There are new algorithms also coming. Again, a contest from NIST for one, uh, not yet here. And on the key action side, we have Diffie Elemen. We already mentioned it. You will see that Diffie Elemen is really widely used. So that's a name that you should keep in mind, and you will see it again. Often you see DH of DE for Diffie Elemen of uh, ECDH when it uses uh, electric, electric curves. We have algorithms, but we also have the implementation. The problem we have there is, and you, have, you probably notice, you all heard about heartbeat. The problem is you can have a good algorithm, and probably the best algorithm are always somehow open source. So if you look at AAS, you have a paper that describes every piece of AAS. So you can read the paper, and if you have the knowledge, you can just review and look if it seems correct, if they are backdoor in the algorithm, whatever you want. And you have some mathematical proof that on paper, AAS works. So we can really look at how it works. Then you have to implement it. And as usual, if you have bugs in there, you can just break the algorithm, not due to the algorithm itself, but due to bugs, due to mistakes in implementation. We have seen that Apple had one issue with a switch case, a typical switch case in programming where they have a double break that forget to check some certificate stuff. So that was a bug on the Apple side, on the iPhone and also Mac OS X device. You have a few bugs in OpenSSL, one which is well known is from Debian, when they just comment the randomness, so there was no randomness and no randomness at some point, which is really bad. As I just mentioned, randomness is really important. If you comment it randomness, then you lose this, some um, yeah, big piece of cryptography of security, and you have a bit. So probably it doesn't make sense to explain a bit in detail, but there, that was again a typical bug. So the the, the um, the heartbeat stuff in SSL is the idea that when you send a heartbeat message, you both send a payload and a length of the payload. So you send, oh, I'm saying, sending a heartbeat with Bobo, for instance, or Bob. Bob, it's three letters. But you can also say, I'm saying a message, sending a message with three letters, Bob, but saying I'm, Bob is 65 letters. And in the implementation, what uh, OpenSL did, they just look at the length without checking that the length is correct. And then they, when they answer, they copy the letter as they have to. That was the idea. They have to copy the message and send the message back. But they rely on the length that was announced in the first bit message that comes in. And if you say that Bob tree letter is actually 60 letter, it just copies 60 bits of your 60 bytes of your memory to the answer, and then you get some piece of your memory in the answer. And you can have in the answer a bit message, piece of your private key. So the private key, which is supposed to be protected, was actually sent, or at least a part of it, was sent back to the one sending the heartbeat message. And that was the heartbeat bug. And it, why it was so bad, it's because you can really have private key going up 
going out from a big message, and you can yeah, have private key that were compromised due to that. So basically, if someone gets the key from Google, for instance, they can have a fake Google.com website with a valid uh, key. That was what happened in the Netherlands when um, one of the SEA was compromised. They gen generate fake certificate. There, you don't need to generate one; you just need to steal it, and maybe they won't even notice. Probably Google will, but some small company won't notice, and uh, it can, it's really bad. So, I previously mentioned that symmetric versus asymmetric encryption it has a cost. Um, I do the. I can I can show it, but I do. Uh, cipher the IP RFC on my computer, firstly using AAS, and secondly using GPG. So the first piece is I'm using OpenSSL. That's if you want to play a little bit of cryptography and cipher stuff and cipher stuff, sign and do some stuff, you can use OpenSSL as a command tool, command line tool. Here you see that OpenSSL ANC is basically encryption, then minus E is to encrypt, a output as ASCII, then the algorithm, it's AAS128, CBC mode, so block mode, uh, then a key, and um, an input, and an output. And it took 15 seconds, so it's quite fast. I don't know the size of the file, I can check, it's IP RFC, it's of probably a few tens of pages, a text file. The, with GPG, I'm doing the same, I'm suffering with a 4K key, so for 1,000, 86 bits, it's basically the same strength that AS128. But it took nearly 70 seconds, so roughly five times more. So you see really the difference between one and the other. It's five times more power, so probably that for that, those machines, it's not really important. If you look from a server perspective, then if you have to deal with 1,000 connections per second or stuff like that, then you have to take that in account. And uh, then again, the reason to use whenever possible symmetric cryptography because it's less expensive in terms of time and consumption. Then you have the debate about key lengths. I will just give you a few minutes to read it. Uh, this comes from a mail exchange we have with Vincent Reimann, so one of the authors of AAS. And we basically ask, do you recommend AAS128 or do we, should we pick more? And he basically answered that they tend, when they're doing cryptography, they were searching for problems. And they are pessimistic guys, so when they found a small problem somewhere, they just said that it's a catastrophe, that's, nah, they need to fix it. And, uh, but he says that from a practical point of view, using AS256 is like wearing a helmet, wearing a helmet when you sit in your car. So it's not really useful, but maybe if you're a read, you can use it, but then it's really the answer, and uh, we have kept that in the paper because probably it's the best way to explain why you should not necessarily take the biggest key. Again, it has an impact. I don't do the math before, but if you do compute how long it took to use this a longer key, you will see that it has an impact on the computer time. So you need more resource to use bigger key also. It's not free. And that's the same for asymmetric cryptography. Um, then for the key lengths, in the paper, we took keylengths.com, which come from the University of Louvain in Belgium. Um, they, I will show you the, the site afterwards. They recommend a few keylengths based on different um, papers and recommendations, and also um, yeah, organism that recommend some keylengths. But basically, what you extract from it is if you want to go to RSA algorithm family, you need to at least use 3K so 3,248 to, uh, bits key for RSA. If you go to ECC, I don't discuss so long about it. It's at least 256. It's a way basically to generate keys. The SHA, you need to, sh to take SHA2 families, so SHA256 and more. And AS128 is good enough. So you'll see that if you look symmetric cryptography, you need really a small key compared to other type of cryptography. That's still interesting. So the website looks like that, but you cannot read it, so I will <laughs> again zoom on it. Uh, what you can see, and I will probably just show the, the, the site afterwards. That's interesting. You have on the site, and I will. So you have different methods that you can choose. 
you can compare all of them. So you have BSI, for instance, it's a German organization. You have the NIST, you have the ECRYPT, you have ANSI, which is in France, so different country, different organizations. So if you don't trust NIST, probably you can trust the ANSI in France or the BSI in Germany. Um, also fact sheet from uh, NSA. Then you can compare all of them, but so you get table that says that, for instance, if you look at ANSI recommendation, if you want to go until 2010, 2020, which is quite close, you need to use at least 100 bits, 100 bits for your key if you use symmetric cryptography. It's just there. If you want to use asymmetric cryptography, you need 2,048 bits. But you can also ask something else to the website and say, enter here, and I can say, okay, I want to go until 2050. And then you get another answer. And then you get that, for instance, based on ANSI recommendation, um, 128 is good enough for symmetric. So AS 128 is valid. You need a 4,096 4, bits for asymmetric cryptography, and so on. You see that other um, equip, for instance, is more strong, and do recommend already 256. So it depends on who do the paper and what you want to do and how paranoid you are, but that's a valid way to just look at the key lengths you need to use. Um, so I recommend that if you want to go deep, deeper in uh, the key lengths that you go to the website and just play a little bit of it. So in the crypto, in the better crypto project, we have actually two cipher suites. And uh, if you look on the mailing list, we are still discussing which algorithm we need in which cipher suite. So it's not really close. But I think that we are now coming to a consensus. But a lot of discussion over there. You have mails and mails and mails and uh, a lot of agreement. Just a notice, NSA have also two cipher suites, A and B. It has nothing to do with the NSA cipher suites. That our own cipher suites, we decide. And A and B is, when I say cipher suite A and B, that's our own, of our own at least, the one we choose. Nothing to do with NSA. So we have two versions, A and B. Version A is a stronger version, and uh, but the cost of stronger version is that you have less, you have fewer clients that are supported. So if you want to have more universal config configuration of your system, you probably need to go to Cypher Suite B. But it, again, it's less secure. Version B is weaker, but it's more universal. So probably in most cases, B is the one you want to choose, except if you can just if you have only modern hard, uh, hardware with modern operating system and just be able to restrict, then you can go to A, but it depends on the constraint you have. So some stuff we do, we always disable SSL version two due to weak algorithms there. We always disable SSL version three due to beast attack. We lose this Windows XP by doing that, but normally as Windows XP is end of support, you should not really take care of it, but some people need to do it, so it has a cost. And we recommend to use TLS 1.0, and you will see that in Cypher Suite A, we use this TLS 1.2, which is the latest and best version of TLS. We disable TLS compression due to SSL crime attack. So it's not unsecure, but it's a way to, it's a vector of attack. So we disable SSL compression. And we implement when the, uh, HSTS, which is basically trying to use this HTTPS whenever it's possible. So when it's possible, you switch back to HTTPS always. Surface suite A, you see it's really close, only for algorithm there. We use this TLS, 1.2 only. We use this, um, the perfect forward secrecy principle, so we use this Diffie element ephemeral, always. We use strong max to, for authentication, and we use this also GCM as authentication encryption scheme. So you will see that there, it's AS256. One of the discussion is to also include AS128, 128, as it's good enough. But right now, in the current rough version, is still the strongest version of AS and only AAS. Uh, so it's pretty, pretty small, <laughs> cipher suite list. If you go to B, then we extend by adding TLS 1.1 and TLS 1.0 to increase the compatibility with other cli uh, with clients, so software clients, and we allow SHA-1. And basically, why we use this SHA-1? Uh, it's because most certs are still using SHA-1 
And if you just remove SHA-1, you lose uh, problem with certificates. You have problem with certificates. Then the cipher suites, um, I'm sorry, probably difficult to read. Then you see it's longer, and new algorithm come here. So you have AS with different key lengths. You have Camellia that come here. You have, and you have non-ephemeral version, oh no, sorry, I said a mistake. And you have different version of SHA that also come. So you see that the list become really longer. Probably doesn't make sense to read all of them, but uh, if you look at the paper, you have a table with all the cipher suite, and uh, it will also probably grow a little bit in the new version. Then um, I will show that on the screen, again, with a sort of small demo. Uh, that's come from a website of Qualis, and it shows the compatibility with different type of clients. So I don't know if you can read it or not. Uh, basically, you have two fail, three fail, and you have fail for Windows XP, uh, which is normally end of life. A fail for Java 6, which is also normally not, should not be used due to security issues there. And you have issue with Java 7, but there you have a way to fix that. So the problem is really with Windows XP and Java 6. So if you use Cypher Suite B, you are compatible with any modern software except Windows XP and um, Java 6. If you want to support Windows XP, you basically need RC4. But RC4 is broken. So that's, you need to, to know that. And uh, you can add RC4 if you want, but then you use a weak algorithm in the list. So practical settings. We have quite a long list of tools we support. Uh, I won't be too long on uh, just listing them, but we have a list of web servers. So we try to find, each time, we try to find the most widely used services. And we try also to have people that knew those services good enough to wrote a configuration. It doesn't make sense to just copy paste one page. We are not expecting that. So we have Apache. That's, I think, clear. Relight TPD is also quite highly used, and it's a nice web server, too. We have Nginx and Microsoft, e, Microsoft IIS. So we, uh, I think we have quite a good coverage of web servers. If you know more and want to add, feel free. SSH, we have OpenSSH and the two Cisco implementation, which are common on a Cisco device, so Cisco ASA and Cisco iOS device. We have the mail servers, then again, Probably the most common, except Exchange, which is not there. We have Dovecot, Cirrus, Postfix, and Exim. We have the VPN with there a good list, I think. We have IPsec, the checkpoints, OpenVPN, PPTP, Cisco, thing. So we also have mail encryption with PGP, GPG, instant messaging encryption with Ejabot on server side, OTR for messages encryption. Uh, Charibadi, Silk, and EP, EPMI and ELO. EPMI and ELO are interesting for system administrator. They use this IPMI and ILO to just log in on the system or just reboot system from remote location. So that's a critical piece of infrastructure for them. It's normally not accessible on the internet. There are some of them accessible like always, but should not. But it's still good to configure it currently. And you have the database system, uh, then again, probably the most common. Again, Microsoft is missing. <laughs> we have Oracle, MySQL, DB2, Postgres, the proxies, and Kerberos. So as usual, if you have more tools and you can add, then you are welcome to contribute and uh, help us to extend the book. We'll slowly go to repeat the practical setting. And uh, the first, the way I want to go there is speak a little bit about mail encryption. If you look at mail encryption, it's quite interesting because you have two ways to protect your mail. At least you have one, and your mail provider has another one. So you, as well, you know, when you send a mail, you can always, at least if the recipient allow it or support it, you can send, cipher the mail you sent or sign the mail you sent. Uh, and for that, you have GPGPGP. GPGP. That uses public-private crypto to, for, to do that. Um, that's interesting because it's fully independent of the mail client and the transport layer. If you really want, and I will show it later, you can cipher the mail in your terminal and then copy the result to the mail if you want it to. That's feasible, you can do it. And uh, you can also use PGPGPG to check 
who sent the mail and just verify that the one that says I sent the mail is the one that really sent the mail. If you look, for instance, in the third community, it's common to have the GPG key ID on this business card. So if I give you my business card, you will have my PGP key ID there. And it's really useful if you want to check that I'm really the one that sent the mail. Chain of trust, uh, you have a principle that I can sign a key. And if you trust me, and then you find a key which is signed by me, then you can probably, at least if you're not too paranoid, trust that that people is really someone, the one he says to be. Because normally, when you sign the key of somebody else, you check his ID. You are supposed to do it, at least. Start TLS for SMTP. Uh, it's not pushed by some provider. Uh, the principle there is by default, or previously SMTP was clear text. So we were able to just send it to an SMTP server and, or just listen at what happened and you see the message in clear text coming on the wire. But you can go to TLS. And if you go to TLS, then you have TLS. So it's ciphered, or it should be ciphered. Um, except if you use an encryption, then it's ciphered. And then you protect from, me from server to server the messages that passes. But that's responsibility of your provider of if you, are, if you own your own mail server that you can basically enable start TLS. And you have there the opportunity TLS, which is basically if TLS is enabled, or try TLS and only use non-TLS if TLS is not available. And by doing so, you hope that at the end everybody will be using TLS. So that's something we really push. I think that Facebook has a good paper on it on saying that yeah, people need to enable TLS and do TLS whenever it's possible. So the paper looked like that. So I just copy-paste of the first pages. Uh, I invite you to go to betacrypto.org and download the PDF and look at it. It's right now updated really frequently. So you have in the bottom of the page, no, the upper side of the page, the revision ID, which is the Git version, but uh, it's built every night. So as a first example, I want to show Apache configuration. So the stuff I want to show is basically, if you look at the first line, you have SSL protocol, all minus SSL v2 and v3. What it says, it's what I said before, we disable SSL v2 and v3 because we don't trust them. Then you have uh, SSL compression off. That's the reason of the, that it could be a vector of attack. Then we disable compression. And then you see that, for instance, we disable weak algorithm like RC4. And we enable strong algorithm like AAS-256. So we force Apache, so it's the SSL cipher suite. We give to Apache a list of cipher it can use. And for some cipher, we explicitly say, don't use it. Like RC4, don't use RC4. Forbidden. And to try to push HTTPS connection whenever it's possible, or at least always, we propose to additionally add a rule that says, if you go to mywebsite.com port 80, HTTP clear text connection, then automatically go to HTTPS, and then go to cipher version of the same site. And the reward rules are exactly that. If you go to website, you are automatic, automatically redirected to the HTTPS version of the same site. It's quite invisible for people. They tend to just type it HTTP, and then the website say go to HTTPS, and people go to HTTPS, and it's roughly secure. Then if we go to mail server, uh, that, that's also come from a, from a guide. So we have in the guide a big section on mails. And we first have a section that gives general in like. We recommend to use opportunity TLS on SMTP, as already mentioned. We also cover three different configurations, three different modes for mail servers. So the first one is the mail submission agent. We have the receiving mail transmission agent and the sending mail transmission agent, so basically the SMTP client. So we have covered three different modes with three different type of recommendations. On the mail server side, we recommend to have a correct DNS configuration without C names. So we remove C names. Uh, our guide also recommend to just enable encryption whenever it's possible and to use, not to use self-signed certificate. Always use certificate that are signed by a trusted authorities, you have no some option uh, like Star TLS that offer uh, free certificate if you meet some, some criteria, but you have a way to have, it doesn't cost a lot of money, or you can even have some, some for free. If you look at BetterCrypto.org, we are using a Star TLS certificate, for instance, but no self-signed. 
when you go to SMTP client mode, uh, <coughs> sorry, we recommend, or again recommend to use the host name in the hello message, and that the, sorry, it uses the host name, but that the host name matches the record in the DNS. We also recommend to use a client certificate to authenticate clients. We also recommend to use in the PTR, in the certificate, a name that match the PTR uh, record, or at least the alternative subject in the certificate matches it, and to don't touch the Cypher suite for SMTP client. So just keep the Cypher suite as it is in SMTP client. When we go to mail submission agent, um, we recommend to use port 587, then to enforce SMTP authentication, but only on encrypted communication. So don't let people to authenticate. So SMTP out on clear text misconnection. It happened, but it's really dangerous if you let people do that. And that we recommend to use the Cypher suite we propose, so A or B. Pick the one you want, but we recommend to use it there. Then from those, recommendation that comes from people that are now administrating big, big mail servers. We end up with configuration for different uh, mail servers, and I picked the one from Postfix. So if you look at Postfix configuration, it's a copy-paste from the paper, so, um, so you can have a closer look afterward if you want. We enable the LS, as you can see, we give the pass to the private and public key. We basically, again, Disable compression, so that's a TLS SSL options, no compression. So same reason than previously. And uh, normally SSL V2 and V3 are disabled, but I missed parameter. <laughs> uh, it's supposed to be there. So we define the surface suite, and it's there that you have SSL V2 and V3 disabled, and so like Apache. Same reason it could be used for attacks. Um, and then we give the cipher suite we recommend. So that's the same. And then for Apache, um, and then try to enforce encryption whenever it's possible. So we we have tried to test. We try to test all our recommendations. So we do some testing and we use some tools. And then I will show you some some results there. So I'm just giving you a list of tools we use, like OpenSSL as client, SSL Labs. It's really cool, and I propose later that you do check your website, SSL Labs. Uh, you have SSL scan, SSL lies, xmpp.net, and so on. So OpenSSL as client. So again, you see it's OpenSSL. And you can use OpenSSL to retrieve information from the website you use. So I propose to do it on Google. So I will take my terminal. Uh, so I will try not to lose my window that time. Yep. So. Um, OpenSSL is quite normally standard on any Unix system. You can install it on Windows system. So I will ask OpenSSL to connect to Google. And I hope the syntax is correct. Okay, it is. Uh, and it's, and basically what it gives out is, um, okay, that's better. I don't, I don't know if the screen is full for you or not. I'm losing some path. But you have, so who issued the certificate? The first, no, the certificate subject, so it's, uh, that's really the issue, I think, GeoTrust. So you have the certificate chain, so from mountainviewgoogle.com, google.com is signed by GeoTrust, uh, which is signed by Equifax at first glance. Then you have the certificate, which is used by the servers, which is public information. Anyway, so you can check it if you want, which is quite a long certificate, with again the subject and who issued the certificate. Uh, no client certificate was sent. I didn't send any certificate. You have information about the SSL handshake. Then you have uh, which version of the Cypher suite was used normally. Um, and then information about really the exchange. And then I got a bad request. That's the result of the tool. I just, I don't know what is really sending. I should, or I should like to see the request from an open CLS client. But um, yeah. So that's the first tool we use in the paper.
then another tool, and unfortunately I cannot show it. Uh, I do try to compile it on my Mac, uh, not, uh, and it failed, <laughs> and I had no time to fix it. Uh, but it's also a nice tool. I think it better works on, on Linux. Um, okay, so it's a SSL scan. SSL scan is a tool uh, that comes from, I forget the company now. Anyway, it just scan all the cipher suite that are available on a certain website. So you can see which cipher suite is supported and not supported, and you can then check if it's comp uh, valid compared to cipher suite A and B. So that's a nice tool. The next one is probably the most easy to understand, and it gives a good view. I will, that tool I want, I propose that you to have a look after what. I will show you and then give you some time to just play a little bit with it. So it's SSL Lab from Qualys. Probably you know Qualys. Uh, now we have A+, plus, by the way, for Bitkit, the bitcrypto.org. So it gave a rating. So we have A. Uh, no, it's A+, plus, so it's better we improve it. It gave a rating about the different parts of the SSL connection. So like uh, the certificate, the prot protocol that was supported, the key exchange, the strengths. It also gives information about the configuration itself. So for instance, it's a SSL version 3 and SSL version 2 are not supported, which is exactly what we say you should do. Uh, TLS 1.1, 1 1.2 were supported and gave a list of cipher suites that were supported. It also gives compatibility information and it says here that, for instance, Windows XP is not compatible with our website, the git.bettercrypto.org. So if you have a Windows XP system, you, can, you will have issue to go to our Git repository. And that's a pity, but it's our life is. So I propose um, to just give you the chance to, to play a little bit with the tool. So I will first show you and then give you a few minutes to look at it. Um, yep. So uh, the website looks like that. So it's ssllabs.com. I do it on bitkit.bettercrypto.org. When you go to the website, um, ssllabs.com, then you have test your servers. You can test your server, yeah. And then you type a domain name. You can say don't show the result on the board because it shows which domain was tested with the rating. Uh, XP, protocol or cipher suite mismatch, fail. It won't work. The same for Java 6, Java 7, and Java 8 is new. But normally, Java 7 and Java 8 could be fixed anyway. So you really should take care about Windows XP. So basically, if you want Windows XP support, then you will have to adapt or suffer suite by adding RC4. Otherwise, you will fail. So I propose to give you a few minutes to play with sslabs.com. If you have a website, just shoot or just pick Google or LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever. And See the result and have a look. Where um, some, someone told, uh, would you use IS-256 or 128, that one? Maybe yes. that one, yeah. Yes. Um, I'm personally still unsure what is better. Um, could, you, could you describe, looking at that slide, why your web servers only support uh, IS-256? Uh, Cryptos. Okay, that I also so yesterday when I just read my slide again, I noticed the same stuff that you. In fact, when we first wrote the paper, we stick to AS two hundred fifty six, and then a lot had a lot of discussion about do we need to extend to AS one hundred twenty eight? Do we need to drop to fifty six? As you, there is a paper that tend to show that two hundred fifty six could be weaker. Um, it really could be, and uh, not sure. Um, and then we ask Vincent Raymond and Johan Damon. And they both say AOS 128 is good enough. Don't care about more, so use AS128. And we know, say, AS 128. And we dis I discovered yesterday that we forget to update the current draft of the paper. So it's a mistake on our side. It should be updated. Uh, at least the build failed, some, something like that. And then in the last version, AS128 is there. And we just need to refresh the PDF. Okay, is not only the reason that that uh, enabling IS one hundred twenty eight uh, not gives you hundred percent on 
on that side on, on SSL labs. Sorry? Um, if you enable ISO 128, yeah. then you can't get uh, the 100% mark. Uh, for SSL, um, I need to check if maybe you lose some point, but uh, we do trust, at least, uh, personally, I do trust Vincent Raymond. I know it personally, and I think what he says is correct. But uh, the fact that one of the stuff we also discuss in the mail, for me, I would keep all version of AAS as long as we have no oops, clue that AS could be broken or some version could be broken. Um, some people think that we should not, so the discussion is open. AS 128 will remain in all cases. Uh, but the point for me is if you really, if you have to the point that you really uh, go to, do, should I use 128 to 256 or to, there is also 196? Uh, yes, I think it's that. <laughs> I'm some, sometimes fixing them. Uh, then maybe you should, maybe better crypto talk is not enough. I mean, for some people like, uh, I don't know, military or organization that really needs strong, strong crypto, then they probably, they probably have inside good cryptographer that can decide by themselves which, which algorithm they need to use. And with the cookbook, we try to have an universal way. So we suspect, we hope it's good enough. But maybe for some particular use, like army, army of defense or some ministry, they need more, and then they need to, to have a closer look by themselves. But uh, right now, as far as I know, Every version of AS is good enough. So I propose to just demo something. I'm willing just to do to, to some demo, uh, and I will just show quickly on the slide and then demo it. Uh, GPG. So why I want to, to, to show GPG is because you can really see the stuff happening, and then you can just install a plugin in your web cli mail client, and you didn't see anything anymore, just a green bar somewhere and you have to type a password and that's it. So it's really easy to use, uh, not too complicated at least, but if you want, you can do it manually in the terminal and you see what, what happened. Like I generate my key, I'm signing, I'm ciphering, I'm unciphering, and each operation you have the result and you can see it. You can do the same with OpenSSL and ciphering with AAS, but GPG is quite nice. So when you do, want to do GPG encryption, you basically, have a message that you want to sign. And you see, so the minus A in GPG is basically ASCII. So instead of having binary that will kill my terminal and produce bizarre output, I'm <laughs> producing ASCII. And you see that normally I input, this is a really secret message, and I have something you probably cannot read. And uh, you can hope that this is ciphered, encrypted. Then you have the other operation of decrypted which is, again, you can do that using GPG. So you see that my personal key is 8,000 bits. <laughs> it's a bit binary, but <laughs> um, you have the signing operation. You use, again, so the minus U define the identity, the minus R, the identity of the guys you want to send the message, and uh, S is for signing. You can check the signature using verify, and uh, everything is basically good, well-documented, in uh, the new PG documentation. And you have key generation, where you can define the kind of key you want, the key length, the expiration period. Um, and then I will go to key signing. So I propose to go step by step and show you. I will first generate a key pair, a new key pair for demo at blah, blah, blah. Then sign something, cipher something, uncipher, and do the operation, and then you can see it. And at the end, I will show you my mail client, and you will see that it's just fully integrated and nothing happened except you have a small lock and a small V, and it says signed or not signed. You can choose what you want, ciphered, not ciphered, and it's green on the upper side. And it's completely transparent, but you can still have the control if you want. And it happened, for instance, if I receive ciphered mail to my Gmail address, I copy-paste the cipher text to a text file and then uncipher in my console, and it works. So now that we have the key, we can start ciphering some secret message, very secret message. So I first go to the list of key I have. So you can see that the key I just generate is there. And now I want to send a key with my uh, email address 
to my new generated key. So that's my email address. You see that the key, key ID is there. The string, the strange uh, figures there is the key ID, basically. So what I need to do is set a BGP to encrypt from my local Id identity to demo and then the message I want to cipher. So I send a very secret message and then go for ciphering. And then you see that what appears is a message which is basically ciphered. Normally you have a very secret message there and then you have something which is completely ciphered. Uh, you should not observe very secret message there or you should not supposed to do, to do it. So now that we have that, I will save it to a file for later use. And then when um, Dima receives that message, he basically needs to uncipher, to decrypt, to be able to read that message. And he can also do that using GPG. So the command is sim really simple now. It's just GPG minus D to uncipher and then my message. Then he asks for the key as I'm now using the private key of Beamer to uncipher, to decrypt the message. So I need to type my password just to allow my computer to, ha to get access to the key and be able to you know, decrypt the message. So I type the key, which is authority, and then you get back a very secret message, which was well protected. I can show you that I'm not cheating. The message I'm decrypting is indeed ciphered and you can not, normally not read it. So the next step I'm willing to show is you know, signing. I will go to another mode where instead of sending a message which is um, encrypted, I will sign the message. Then, <coughs> as remember the previous slide, I will now use my private key to cipher a message, to sign a message, and Demo will use my public key to check the signature. So, Generating the signature, I use GPG, again, minus A to get uh, something that I can read, minus S for sign, my local identity, which is just there. My remote identity, just there. And again, my very secret message. Then again, it asks for my key. You notice that that time is not the demo key, but my key, my normal key, my key ISO BE. So, B -E. so I'm typing my password, and it works, and it doesn't work. <laughs> and right, it should work, and then I got a PGP message, which is basically a signature. So I will save it to a file for later use. It keeps the key in memory, so it doesn't ask for the key immediately, and then I can show you that it's indeed my key, that my signature. So if I want to verify, I simply use verify, verify, and then message dot seek, and it says that this is a valid signature for my identity, which is the video at sir.be with other sub identities. So you can actually check that, as I mentioned, that how will he sign me, the video will sign a message, um, and Demo can check it by simply using my public key. Public key. The next step I was willing to show is key signing. So um, the principle of key signing um, is I will give some trust to the key. Oops, looking at the slideshow. Yes. So the principle behind uh, key signing is if Alice signed the key of Blake, it means that she check the identity of Blake and she give trust to the, to the um, key of Blake. Normally you can have, you have what we call chain of trust is if Alice signed Blake, Blake signed Chloe and so on, you can normally end up to Jeff and think that Jeff is really Jeff as it was signed by a few intermediate person that you should trust. Um, it can be used as for social engineering also because you have relationship between people. If you're in a certain world and your key is signed by other people that are mostly your colleague or your peers, and then you can do some, yeah, some social engineering there. So if you want to sign 
the key, we just again simply set CPG sign key. The key I use to sign, which is always the same key, my key, my own key. Um, just take the ID. The key I want to sign. And I need to type minus A. Okay, and actually, yeah. it's already signed. <laughs> um, so I will sign. I have another identity. It doesn't matter. So I take another identity of mine for the demo. Yes, voila. Then I will sign demo key with my key. So it says, do you want to sign? It gives the identity I want to use, so do you, want to, do you really want to sign? But if all is no, I say yes, I want. It asks me for the key, so I have to type my password. Then <coughs> signature is done. And it's really simple. You can also, if you really want, export the key with the signature by doing export key and then the identity you want to export. You can also internally export private key, but it's something that you normally don't do uh, regularly except for backup, as you're supposed to protect your private key. Uh, so the identity is just, um, I'm searching for it. <laughs> Too many key, let's step to one. And it failed. So let's look at the main page, and it says that it's minus minus uh, minus minus export. So do it again, and then here's my key. And you can save it to a file, or you can also even upload to a server by using a send key. I won't do it right now as it's a demo key, but you can send it to a to a to a server. You can view the signature on a key by going to a GPG server. Basically, all the GPG server are synchronized together, so you can go to any one. I will use the one of the MIT. Uh, that's a well-known one. I have all the key, and I can take, for, an, for example, my identity, search for my name, retrieve a list of key that matches. I can use my third key. And then you see that my key was signed by a few people, then, and, I, and I can follow. So if I took Aaron Kaplan, which is a co-author of the project, I have his key and who signed his key, and I can follow all the paths. Um, and then again, it could be user social engineering, as you know, who signed the key and who is knowing. So some people prefer not to publish signature, not to have key signed, as it's a way to know in which type of organization they work and with who they work. Uh, Okay, let's go back to slide now. Then GPG. Um, the nice stuff with PGP, GPG, PGP, GPG, is that you can integrate GPG directly to the mail client. And it's more convenient than doing that in the terminal like I did. That was just for the demo, you can show that you can do it, but you have tools. Uh, for instance, if I took Apple Mail, which is the default mail client on Macintosh, I can start create a new mail, and again, you see open PGP there, and I can type Aaron Kaplan, I want to send him a mail from my third address, for instance, and then I have a small V and a small lock. The small V says, if it's there, that the message will be signed, and that there, the message won't be signed, and you see that the green disappears, I will sign the message, and I will cipher the message by clicking on the lock. The lock is now closed. So, I can say a very secret message. Sorry. Hello. This is very secret. And then when I click on send, the, message, the mail is ciphered. It doesn't ask for the key because the, I'm not connected to the internet. Uh, it doesn't ask for the key just because the key is still memory, but you see that it's fully integrated and you have nothing to do. The mail client take care for you of doing the encryption, looking at the key, and uh, doing every step needed. 
on the other side, when you receive a mail, which is encrypted, it goes to the mail client, the plugin detects that the mail is encrypted, and then propose, ask you for the key, and then decrypt the message for you. So that's pretty straightforward. So, back to slide again. A set of other tools that will also be mentioned, it's tools to create ciphered containers, where you can put information that you want to protect. You have TrueCrypt. No, TrueCrypt is open for a lot of discussion, as it seems that the project could be finished. So we, we wait for more just to know what really happened. Uh, that's quite a pity for TrueCrypt in the sense that first phase of auditing the code of TrueCrypt was just done. They have audited the Windows bootloader now, and they will start by auditing the rest of the code. Uh, but now we, we have to wait. We have, there are other tools like Apple 5 Volt to create a complete container on Macintosh. You have the same tool, same sort of tool on Microsoft now. To, as a good way to keep passwords safe, you have KeyPass and LastPass, one password. So a few tools that are really valuable there. So to now conclude the talk, I'm just willing to give an idea on what we want to introduce now uh, in the future of the project. So first, um, we are willing to produce HTML version, an easy to copy paste version, because we figure out that the PDF is not that convenient to copy paste configuration. We are also willing to introduce a configuration generator in the sense that right now we have a PDF which is valid for a certain version of a certain tool. With a configuration generation tools, we can imagine that you say, I have that particular version of the operating system, of that library, of that tools, and it automatically generates the configuration based on your requirement, like I want version A or version B of the Cypher suites. Uh, we were also willing to introduce new tools and new protocols um, as we extend the paper and continue to keep it updated. Um, so the current state, the current state at least end of May. So we now have a solid, solid basis for Cypher suite A and B. Uh, we are now convinced for both. Discussion are quite you know, close. Um, we get uh, a nice publicity in a few conferences like that one. And uh, we are really glad of being able to present our work. Um, we are still working on a few sections that need to be rewrote, and we are still writing those sections um, in a better way. And then conversion to HTML to have a nice copy-paste version that we want soon. If you want to participate, we are looking for people with different expertise, different profiles, so you are feel free to, to contribute. Um, there is a document you can, it was to read it, find for bugs or mistakes. There is a mailing list where you can just ask question or just comment, give feedback, propose. Um, <coughs> sorry. If you can just give us new configuration, new, new tool that you can support, you can, we, are, we will also be glad to receive your contribution. And uh, finally, if you want, probably bettercrypto.org better is the place to go. Then you can find the paper, and uh, you can also go to the gitbetacrypto.org, which is the main Git repository, which is read-only by default. We have a copy on uh, GitHub, where you can normally push stuff, and we have the mailing list from 380, which is hosted by 380, where you can post your mail, and everybody will receive them. It will also be subscribed to the mailing list if you want to contribute to discussion and the ongoing work of the project. So thank you for attention, and uh, if you have questions. Thank you.